Welcome to the Kazama Satellites project team. We've been working with your management and project team since 2009 to design and plan for this installation phase of the project. Throughout, we have focused on safety, maintained open lines of communication, and worked collaboratively, all in the spirit of forming one team that will make a difference in executing this project successfully. Now that we're entering this important phase of the project, the need to continue these behaviors are even more critical. Every person on the team, no matter what their responsibilities are, needs to remember that they are one team, one project, working together. We will succeed only if we can live up to the primary value of this project. Nobody gets hurt. We expect everyone on the job to remember every day, every minute, for every task, to think safety first and work safely always. Those who have come before us in Block 15 have established superior safety standards, and we intend to improve on that. We're glad you're here. Welcome to Block 15. The material in this video is designed to remind you of important safety factors that are vital to this team's success. We all believe that we can execute the Kazamba Satellites project safely, and regardless of your role, the topics we cover in this video should be considered reminders of your previous training and experience. You wouldn't be out here if we didn't think you were skilled and experienced enough to do your job safely and properly the first time. So use the topics we cover here to remind you of your previous training and experience and keep in mind at the start of every day that we want you to end that day safely. We all need to look out for each other and complete this job safely and incident free. This information is designed to help you achieve that, so please pay attention, and welcome to our team. The Kazamba Satellites Project is a continuation of work begun nearly a decade ago in Angola's Block 15. The Kazamba A and B FPSOs are mirror images of world-class vessels that have produced millions of barrels of hydrocarbons and continue to be highly productive. Block 15 holds numerous commercial reservoirs, and the Satellites Project will bring two more reservoirs, the Mavacola and Clochus fields, into production. Key to this effort is the subsea work you're going to do to connect the reservoirs to the FPSOs. The Kazamba Satellites team management has detailed processes that will help promote the safety and success of the project. Besides the basic safety training that contractors and your employers are required to provide for you, our satellite's surf offshore orientation video offers a brief introduction and refresher course on how to work safely and do your job properly. Again, the underlying goal is nobody gets hurt. You should also remember that everyone working on this project is a safety leader. It doesn't matter who you are or what you're doing. You are a safety leader. The topics we will cover in this presentation include emergency response, escape chute training, surfer transfers, onboard work activities, personal protective equipment, PPE, permits to work, working at heights, JSA's step back 5x5, five five, malaria control, waste management, incident reporting, observation and intervention, and security. Changes in hazards, conditions, work activities, and other issues will be discussed every day by your supervisor and safety officer. Please be aware of these changes. If you have any questions or concerns about your duties or the activities around you, please ask your supervisor or a safety officer. Safety officers on the FPSO, or the accommodation vessels, can be identified by their red hard hats. It is imperative for anyone working offshore to fully understand emergency response procedures. Your life and the lives of others depend on your actions in an emergency you must be able to identify the different types of alarms you might hear. You must know where muster points are, and you must remember evacuation procedures, no matter what vessel you are on. 
Each vessel has a safety orientation, station bill, and other safety instructions and precautions. Pay attention to what you learn from these instructions since they are specific to your safety on that vessel. If you are uncertain about any situation or do not receive a safety orientation when you board a vessel, see your supervisor or the vessel's safety officer. In any emergency, follow the rules of the vessel you are on. Pay close attention to vessel-specific emergency response training that you have received or will receive. If you understand the procedures and your role in an emergency, it will go far to accomplish and expedite the safe evacuation of you and your fellow workers. In case of emergency on one of the FPSOs, it's important for you to know how to get to a safe place. The FPSO utilizes escape chutes, also known as the integrated escape chute and life raft system. And this will be your primary way to escape the FPSO in an emergency. Before going offshore or upon arrival at the FPSO, you must have had a training course that combines classroom and practical training using the chute. The chute is a protected enclosed system that helps personnel who have to use life rafts to evacuate the installation from deck level. It's an interesting ride to safety, but you should remember all you learn about the system so you can use it safely and properly. The escape chute system offers protection from heat flux, flame, and smoke or gas. If you have to use the chute system, remember to be aware of your surroundings and any hazards that may be present. Try to stay calm and don't panic. In an emergency, you must wear a life vest when using the escape chute. If you fully understand the FPSO's muster and evacuation procedures, you will have the best chance to evacuate safely. On the FPSO, your initial muster will be behind the blast wall. Subsequent muster points leading to full abandon will be identified by the person in charge of that muster point. We're going to move a lot of people around in the field every day. If you travel by helicopter, you must have received your helicopter underwater evacuation training. You will also need to be aware of what's expected of you when you get on and off the surfers, our offshore transport vessels. If you're working offshore, chances are that you'll be using these vessels, maybe every day, maybe a few times a day. Whether you're embarking or disembarking, it's important that you are vigilant in your actions every time you're on a surfer. One mistake, one time, and you or someone around you could be seriously injured. You must receive training orientation for transport on the surfer before you go to work in the field. However, here are a few things to remember. Always follow the surfer safety instructions and procedures. If you have questions about them, ask someone who can give you an answer before you board the vessel. The pilot and the surfer crew are in charge on the vessel. Their instructions should always be followed by everyone on the boat. The surfer landing person in charge is in charge when the surfer arrives at the destination, and his instructions must be followed. You must wear a life jacket during all transfers. And don't just slip it around your shoulders. It should fit properly with all straps, buckles, or zippers secure. You must wear safety boots on board the surfer. No flip-flops or lightweight shoes. Give your luggage to the seaman before getting on or off the boat. This includes backpacks, which are, without exception, considered to be luggage. You may not handle luggage when transferring to the surfer. Get on or get off only when you are signaled to do so by the surfer crew or landing person in charge. Your hands must be free when climbing up or down the ladder. Watch the rise and fall of the sea. You should not embark or disembark until the surfer is on the top of a wave. You must remain seated during the crossing and until the boat is docked at the boat landing. Most important, be careful and pay attention.
While conducting work activities on board the FPSOs for the Kazamba Satellite Surf Project, there are certain guidelines you should remember to help ensure the safety of everyone on the project. First, this is a live production facility. You may be working on or near systems that are powered up. Be sure that you and your colleagues are not in the line of fire. Stay out of the way of any potential release of energy, electricity, pressure, or any other potentially hazardous release. Second, if you don't have the right permit, you are not allowed to do the work. You can only do work that has the proper permits, JSAs, and lockout tagouts approved and in place. Third, follow procedures. Utilize all appropriate tools and PPE and follow only approved procedures. Do not change a procedure in the middle of a job. Fourth, stay aware at all times. Always be on the lookout for unsafe conditions. If something looks risky or suspicious, stop the job and tell someone. You might be the first person to notice an unsafe condition, and your action could prevent an injury or accident. Fifth, understand what's going on around you. Know the scope of your task and know the dangers. Be sure you understand all emergency response procedures. If you're uncertain about any procedure, ask a supervisor. We do everything we can to make this project safe and to avoid unsafe conditions and situations, but sometimes the job demands that we do our job in a potentially dangerous atmosphere or in a loud environment and sometimes we are exposed to conditions and risks that could cause an injury or illness. That's why we have rules about using personal protective equipment. These rules are not an option, they are mandatory. You have to follow these rules, and you have to wear your PPE properly. You also need to be sure your PPE is in good condition. If your PPE is broken, torn, frayed, or otherwise not in good condition, you may not be in good condition when the day is done. Sometimes certain tasks require additional PPE, but here are the minimum PPE requirements for our job. Hard hat. Green for less experienced, inexperienced, and short-time workers, and white for experienced workers. An authorized supervisor will determine who needs to be recognized as a short-time worker. There's a procedure in place to determine who is qualified to wear a white hard hat. FPSO safety officers wear a red hard hat. The shell of the hard hat is usually good for about three years, the harness inside for about two years. Wear your hard hat the right way. Safety boots. Again, be sure the boots fit right to avoid injuries, blisters, and discomfort. Keep your boots clean and dry, and wear clean socks every day. Safety glasses. Safety glasses must be approved and include side shields. Prescription glasses must have safety lenses and side shields, or you can wear safety goggles designed to fit over the regular prescription glasses. Gloves. You should wear leather gloves to protect against hand injuries. Special gloves are required for welding, handling chemicals, and other jobs. Be sure your gloves fit. Flame retardant long-sleeved coveralls. These should always be zipped up with sleeves rolled down. Hearing protection. Beyond the firewall, you'll always need hearing protection. Sometimes double protection is needed. See your supervisor about this before you start your job. You should always remember that to be properly protected on the job, you should not have lighters, matches, or other unapproved ignition sources in your possession. Cell phones are also considered to be ignition sources. Do not bring cell phones into the operations area. Always inspect your PPE before you wear it. If something is not right or does not fit properly, replace it before you start your task. Also, you have the responsibility to intervene if you see someone not wearing the right PPE or if they do not have it on properly.
A very important part of the Kazamba satellite's operation is the permit-to-work system. For most jobs, it ensures proper planning and preparation, pre-start checks, work activity approvals, proper control during work phases, correct and adequate energy isolation, and assessment and documentation of work practices. There are four kinds of work permit categories. The first category is for general work. General work permits are required for many common work activities. The second work permit category is critical work, including critical and heavy lifts, work over the side, high-risk electrical, and other unique activities. The third is confined space entry. This covers situations when a worker has to enter areas that are not easily accessible. The fourth is hot work, which involves any activity that creates ignition or spark points. Permits to work include energy isolation considerations, including electrical, pressure, mechanical, and other issues. Associated isolation certificates must be used whenever work is to be performed on isolated equipment. If you have any doubt about the kind of work permit you need, ask your supervisor. Be sure the permit covers all phases of your work. If you're uncertain, get a higher level work permit. We can't always work at ground or deck level. Some work is going to require that we work more than six feet above ground. A full body harness must be used when working on scaffolding, above a height of six feet or over water. Obviously, the best method of fall protection is to eliminate or engineer the fall hazards out of the task. Before working at heights, you are required to receive working at heights training from your employer. A JSA must be performed before working at height. It should always include a plan for emergency rescue. Remember to inspect your safety equipment each time before you use it. Everything should be in good condition before each use. Take broken, torn, or frayed safety harnesses or lanyards out of service. When working at height, always remember your training. During this project, there could be many situations when activities cause workers to be exposed or in the line of fire. Working on a live production facility working where lifts or pressure tests are conducted can result in this exposure. Mooring operations can also create line of fire exposure. Line of fire includes unplanned pressure releases, rope or line snapback events, falling and moving objects, heat, electricity, and other potential releases of energy. Mooring operations should only be handled by experienced, trained, and authorized personnel. Fatalities can and have occurred during mooring operations. All non-essential personnel should avoid mooring operations. Always be aware of what's going on around you and who is working around you. Keep yourself and others out of the line of fire. JSAs and step-back 5x5s are both excellent procedures to use to ensure safe work practices. A job safety analysis, or JSA, is an important pre-job tool for planning and safety that involves participation by everyone on the work team. JSAs are part of the permit-to-work system. Simply defined, a JSA identifies the major steps of the job then identifies potential hazards for each step, and then determines the best safeguards to use to prevent or mitigate the identified hazards. Additionally, a JSA should clarify and coordinate each team member's responsibilities and also identify all required equipment and PPE for the job. A JSA should be considered a living or evergreen safety tool. It is initially developed before a task happens, but should always be updated if the situation or conditions change. The work team should refer to the JSA during the job to be sure safeguards and previously identified hazard mitigation is in place. 
There are two types of JSAs. A reference JSA is prepared ahead of time for recurring tasks. The tasks involve common hazards and lessons learned from prior experience. They are kept on file in the control room and should be used as a starting point for a real-time JSA, which must be conducted with all team members. A real-time JSA is prepared by the entire work team just before starting a task. The real-time JSA must include specific and unique hazards for the worksite and the day the task is to be performed. The real-time JSA can be a revised reference JSA that is unique to that day's activities, or it can be a completely new JSA. A JSA should be used for any task that is more than a simple routine task of low complexity. A routine task of low complexity and low exposure to risk is an ideal task for using Step Back 5x5. If you're using Step Back 5x5, look at the job site and consider the task at hand. Then back five steps away from the site. From that vantage point, look carefully at the site and think about the steps of your job for a few minutes before you start. Think about how you or your fellow workers could be injured and how you might eliminate or reduce that risk. If a work permit is required for your task, you must use a JSA before you begin. The job safety analysis is not just paperwork. It is your safety plan for the job you're doing. You are in an area where malaria still exists. Even when you're offshore, you must take precautions to avoid getting malaria. All ExxonMobil and EEAL employees and contractor personnel must have completed your company malaria training, obtained the necessary amount of chemoprophylaxis, and signed a malaria attestation form before arriving on the FPSO. If you have not completed the training or do not have the medication or attestation form, please contact your supervisor for instructions. The World Health Organization recommends the well-known ABCD approach to malaria control. A covers awareness. You must be aware of the risks of malaria in Angola. You should understand effective prevention strategies. You should be aware of the symptoms of malaria and where to seek a proper diagnosis and treatment of the disease. B covers bite prevention. If you are not bitten, you can avoid getting malaria. Prevention is important to both immune and non-immune workers. To prevent being bitten by mosquitoes carrying the malaria virus, wear long sleeve shirts and long pants, preferably light colored. Outer clothing, except for fire retardant coveralls, should be permethrin treated. You should use insect repellent containing 20% DEET on exposed skin. C covers chemoprophylaxis. All non-immune personnel should take proper doses of chemoprophylaxis, which could be in the form of malarone or other medications. Take the medications before, during, and after your stay in malaria-prone areas, according to your doctor's instructions. D covers diagnosis. Prompt diagnosis and the correct treatment of malaria can mean the difference between life and death. A fever that occurs any time up to three months after departure from a malaria risk area should be regarded as a medical emergency and treated immediately. If you have to seek diagnosis or treatment, be sure to tell your medical professional that you have recently been in a malaria risk area. If you feel ill or display any symptoms of malaria, advise the medic and your supervisor immediately. Waste management is important for a number of reasons. ESSO Exploration Angola Limited has a program in place to manage waste to protect our health, protect the environment, to obey the laws and regulations EEAL is committed to, and to properly minimize, separate, label, and store restricted waste. We must do our part to segregate waste according to hazard classification. These classifications include restricted waste like oily rags, paint materials, filters, and others, medical waste, domestic waste like food and personal garbage, 
scrap wood, and scrap metal. Additionally, medical waste must be segregated from other restricted wastes. Here's what we must do regarding waste materials. First, we must separate and group it according to categories as determined by rules established by EEAL. We must label all waste, oily rags, filters, metal, and so forth, whether it's in containers, drums, boxes, bags, or other units. Hazardous waste products should have a label and a material safety data sheet, or MSDS. The waste should be stored until it can be removed. Keep adequate space between waste containers, especially containers with different types of waste. Incident reporting is a very important way for this team to prevent future incidents. Incidents can be injuries, illnesses, and other potentially negative or dangerous events. It doesn't matter how small the event is, if an injury or illness occurs, it must be reported so that the situation can be studied and mitigated. Your responsibility to report an incident is not limited to your work crew or work area. It doesn't matter where you are or who is involved, you must report it. If management doesn't know about an injury or illness, we miss the opportunity to do something positive to prevent someone else from getting hurt. By reporting an incident, you allow the project to learn from that situation and take steps to prevent it from happening again. You are helping to prevent future incidents and injuries. If you see an incident, you should report it immediately to your supervisor and your safety representatives. When a non-injury incident occurs, an observation and intervention card or notification should be submitted to your supervisor or a safety officer as soon as possible. We should not be reluctant to approach others, especially when what we do or say can prevent others from being harmed. Everyone on the job, no matter your job title or task, is expected to observe and approach others, either to intervene when you see an unsafe act or condition or commend someone for a safe job done well once the job is completed. Observation and intervention is a process we use to really see what's going on around us and how people behave as they work. Observation is first. We see our surroundings, see how people are doing their jobs around us. Most often we intervene because we've identified an unsafe act or condition. By intervening, we can eliminate or at least reduce the chance that the unsafe situation will occur again, and this reduces the chance of injury. By intervening, you are showing your fellow workers that you care about them, that safety is important to you, and that you care about the high safety standards of the project. Your intervention helps your fellow workers work safer and reminds everyone how they're expected to work. It doesn't matter how experienced you are, whether you're part of management or part of the workforce, if you don't work in a particular area or even if you don't speak the same language. What does matter is that everyone has the responsibility to conduct an observation and intervention. We can all avoid unsafe situations if we observe carefully and intervene to prevent people from doing something that could hurt them or others. If we are committed to safety, we must always intervene to prevent unsafe or incorrect actions. If you see something that is unsafe, it is your responsibility to intervene. We should all be visible, constant champions for safety. Ask your supervisor or safety officer for observation and intervention forms. Security is always a key element in maintaining our safety and the safety of the vessels we're working on. The security of the operations on the Kazamba facilities is everybody's business. Do not enter restricted areas unless accompanied by someone with security clearance to enter these areas. Your offshore point of contact will advise you on baggage security and search policies. You should always wear your identity card at all times when outside your cabin. This is mandatory. 
If you have any doubts about security, baggage, and personnel searches and other issues, your offshore point of contact can provide further advice. The project is also concerned with your personal security when traveling. Be sure to pay attention during your travel security training. The Kazamba Satellites Surf Project is a significant job involving a lot of people with many different responsibilities. The information here should help to remind you about important aspects of the job. Everyone on this job must be specifically trained on escape chutes, emergency response, the permit to work system, working at heights, surfer regulations, and malaria prevention. Before you join this project, you should have received other training required for your specific responsibilities. For our safety culture to flourish, it must be embedded throughout the organization. Therefore, safety leadership in Block 15 comes from not just supervisors and managers, but from employees and contractors alike. I expect from all team members to not only comply with procedures, but to create a culture where we look out for one another, just as we would our own family. I also expect each of you to approach your Block 15 family members any time you see an act which may even appear to be unsafe. At SO Angola, our safety objective is simple. Nobody gets hurt. Some people say it can't be done. I believe it can be done. In fact, many teams right here in Block 15 have gone many years without a recordable injury. Through your personal commitment and willingness to care for each other, we can achieve our objective. We hope you'll use your knowledge, your skills, your experience, and good common sense as we move forward on the Kazama Satellite's development. Let's do our work in such a way that when we go home, we can proudly say we each made a difference in building a successful project together, safely as one team. Again, welcome to the Kazama Satellite's project team. Nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets hurt.